Hello, and welcome to Literary Prospects, where we talk to authors and other literary professionals about books, publishing, and the writing life. I'm Kelly Vick, the host of the program, and it's my pleasure to introduce today's guest, author Julia Fine. Julia Fine is the author of The Upstairs House, which won the Chicago Review of Books Award for Fiction, and What Should Be Wild, which was shortlisted for the Bram Stoker Award for Superior First Novel. Her third novel, Madalena in the Dark, was released in June 2023. Julia teaches writing in Chicago, where she lives with her husband and children. Let's get started. Julia Fine, it's great to have you here. Congratulations on Madalena in the Dark, your third novel. Um, it was named a Best Book of the Summer by Vanity Fair, the Chicago Tribune, Lit Hub, Book Riot, and Publishers Weekly. It's a good read editor's pick, good reads editor's pick, and was a most anticipated book in Salon, Bustle, Crime Reads, Chicago Magazine, and others. Uh, Salon calls it absorbing and necessary, velvet rich, thick with scrumptious detail. Publishers Weekly says, fine beguiles with this decadent tale of desire set in 18th century Venice. This will frighten and captivate in equal measure. And Bustle says, it's a feast of a book, rich in setting, steeped in desire, and haunted by a growing obsession. Um, I could go on, but I would like to actually talk to you. <laughs> so, um, so, so let's get to it. What can you tell us about uh, this beautiful book, Madalena in the Dark? Yeah, oh gosh. Um, it is about it is it's about two um teenage musicians in 18th century venice and mm -hmm. their sort of ambitions and obsessions i think is a good way to put it both with sort of their music and their futures and um also with each other mm -hmm. and i was really interested in um the two sort of pieces that came together to make this book um the first was the knowledge of this, uh, the Ospedale system in Venice, which is, it's funny because I uh, knew about it growing up because I had like a book on tape for kids, sort of like an audio book about Vivaldi. And it was these, um, a series of tapes called Classical Kids. And they were basically designed to introduce kids probably between the ages of like five and 10 to classical music and the Vivaldi one, each of them was like, you had the composer interacting with kids in a different sort of fictional story. And then they oh, cool. play little snippets of the music in the background. Um, and so I had the Vivaldi one and it was set at this, the Ospedale della Pietà, where he was teaching these like orphaned young girls to play music and like leading the orchestra and writing for them and so I in the back of my mind sort of like always knew that was a part of his story and then um as an adult then sort of encountered it again and realized like wow what a great place for a novel like Venice in the early 1700s at this like church orphanage music school like this mm -hmm. seemed a place to write a book um and so that was like, you know, what, what can I do with that? And then I also found myself really interested in, I think, um, I, everything that I, like, I'm always really drawn to the way that women in particular sort of like balance their lives with their art. Um, and mm -hmm. I think in a certain way, like all of my books have been about that in their own sort of way. Um, and so I was interested in looking at like, what did it mean that these were women playing orchestral music at a time when really there was nowhere else um, in Europe, at least where women were playing orchestral music. And sort of since this was the um, sort of at the time was sort of the epicenter of like string, Western string music and sort of having an orchestra, like it meant really they were the only ones in the world. Um, and so I was interested in like what, in particular would be like what would make that different than like say it was like a boys conservatory um and I also found myself thinking a lot about my own experience as a teenager which admittedly was a while ago at this point <laughs> um and I, I just remember those very intense um 
early teen relationships where you have a very good friend but it's sort of like frenemy is just like such a reductive term but uh where you know you're like sort of obsessed with your friend and you're not sure if it's like sexual or if you just really adore this person or if you really hate this person and are really jealous (laughs) to see them and like it I think that that's like a pretty normal um stage in like teen girl friendship and so that was something I was interested in and then throwing it into this context of sort of a hyper competitive artistic environment um made it even more interesting to me was there it sounds like this has been sort of simmering for a long time this idea of Vivaldi and Pieta and this um was there like a particular spark that let you know like now is the time like now is the time that I'm gonna start to work on this project and this story you know there really wasn't I'd been working on something else that was not gelling and I just couldn't quite find the project like I had done a lot of reading and research and wanted to write about it generally but had not been able to sort of like find a specific way in um and I like randomly have you know, just randomly came across this, like in some music documentary that we were watching for fun. Um, Like the, I remembered the Pieta and felt like, okay, well, but if I try to write a book there and it all just felt like it sort of fell into place in a way that I had been like forcing the pieces um, for this other project. And so, yeah, I think it was probably a lot of it was that it had been sort of on the back burner simmering. And I had sort of had this like vibe this atmosphere in mind you know for years um but a lot of it also was I think just saying like okay well this thing clearly isn't working and rather than continue to like knock my head against the wall what if I try this other thing um and it ended up being definitely the right call (laughs) yeah it it turned out well (laughs) Mm -hmm. Uh, how how much of this beautiful world that you've created in this book is actually based on what Venice was like or would have been like in 1717 and how much is your beautiful dreamlike world building we know there are a few things that we don't typically see in in everyday life in the book so Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean the the sort of more supernatural, like spiritual aspect of it. Um, so part of part of the story is that um, Madalena, uh, the character, makes sort of this bargain with a creature in the canals. It's sort of like a Little Mermaid inspired, like Faust Faustian, which I guess Little Mermaid is sort of Faustian. Um, yeah. But there's like a creature there that they're sort of making these sacrifices to. So obviously that I made up although I didn't make it up quite like it wasn't as much of a stretch as you would think because um it's there's this ritual that she where she first encounters the creature is based on um an actual ritual that they still do in Venice although I think nowadays it's much more um performative than it is like actually believing that it's having some sort of even religious significance. Um, But every year the doge, who was like the head of the Venetian government would take a wedding ring and row it out to the sort of the place in the canal where the uh, Adriatic Sea meets the canal. So like where the waves start to get rough and would do this like wedding ceremony um, to the sea. And so like a lot of the things that are, it's like all I did was take that like a step or two further. Um, Yeah. And so there were a few things like, that in here um but I also did I mean I did about like a year and a half of research before I even started writing um and I tried really hard to make like all of the social situations like Venice uh in Venice just throughout its history like until it sort of turned into part of Italy or until Napoleon conquered it and maybe even after just had a very interesting social system that was different like it was a republic um and so sort of the idea of like it it didn't have the nobility that we think of when we think of other parts of Western or Eastern Europe, um, but it did have like a very strict social caste system. Um, And so that is all based on truth and the idea that only one son per family got married, like that was true, that all of these women were being sent to nunneries because there was nobody to marry because only one son was getting married, like that was all based on truth. Um, And it also is set at a time um, like Venice, as a cultural power was waning by the time Vivaldi was writing um, and living, writing music and living in Venice. And so the book takes place sort of at this like turn 
almost. And so a lot of what I was interested in were like, what were the little moments where you can sort of see how Venice as this powerful political player um, is sort of stepping back and going downhill sort of right around the time these girls are coming of age. And so all of that is based on sort of actual political and historical fact. Interesting. Yeah, it's interesting that because I was, you know, this, so that was played into you choosing this particular time, this turn <laughs> of, of of Venice, as well as the turn of these characters, I guess, um, in a way. You had planned to go to Venice uh, when you started writing this book, and then uh, COVID happened, yeah. right? So, <laughs> so how did that work out? Um, yeah, so I... The idea for this, I sort of committed to this idea. This is so sad. I, I sort of was like, this is going to be the book in like January, 2020, mm-hmm. um, which <laughs> I, I was pregnant at the time. So I knew like, you know, obviously I was not going to be able to just like bust out a whole book in the next six months. Um, but I didn't know quite the extent of how like little I would end up writing for a full year. Um, so I, yeah, so obviously I couldn't go anywhere. Um, I knew that if I was going to actually like, publish this book I would need to have gone to Venice and sort of fact checked and just sort of made had more than just my like off-site research um and so I ended up booking a trip for it was like January 2022 would that have been Omicron I don't know it was like right when I I tried to block it out (laughs) Uh, yes I can't remember dates at this point but I ended up I ended up going like on the very back end of the process, like I'd already sold the book and done the majority of my like substantial wow. edits. Um, and it was, I think I had like a few weeks before I was going to turn in the final draft of the manuscript. Um, and I finally made it. And I honestly think for this particular project, it was a really great way to do it because then when I was walking around in Venice, I felt like I was walking in the world of my book in a way that oh, that's cool. really magical that's Which, again cool. because Venice looks I mean it looks a lot like it did it hasn't changed all that much superficially so you um and you don't play the violin right I don't um, no. but you you capture the fine points of being a classical musician uh, particularly a violinist so well in this novel at least it seems so to me I am not a <laughs> classical musician either yeah. you fooled me um, so how did you do that? Oh gosh. Um, so I, I did grow up, um, like studying music. I was never especially talented, but I did play piano and I took voice lessons and I like knew basic music theory. Um, and then my younger brother played cello for years and like was quite good at it. Uh, so I had that exposure to, to like going to recitals and hearing him practice and sort of knowing how it works. Um, but I also read as much, there aren't as many, I mean, there, there probably are some that I just couldn't find, but there are not as many musicians, musician writers, um, at least sort of writing about music in the kind of way that I'm interested in, which makes sense, because it's like, if you are that talented a musician, you're spending a ton of time. Um, but I do have some friends who played very seriously um, before they started writing, who helped, who sort of like read through for me and I also watched a lot of performances um and listened you know to a lot of music and I watched you can find a lot of these um sort of superstar musicians give master classes to other to music students so you can like pop in and see you know like Carol Trosov giving a master class to a Juilliard student just like on YouTube and so I would go in and watch that and I'd look at the language they were using and sort of the the things they were critiquing and while I obviously cannot get in there and like make that sound I could sort of I like tried to teach myself like the language of it yeah. um and then also read a decent amount of like music theory and sort of musicology and things like that it worked out <laughs> uh, desire is a big theme in mm-hmm. this book, um, the insatiable quality of desire, getting one thing and then wanting more, how far a person will go to serve their own desire. But um, also I think misplaced desire, like not really even knowing what you want or maybe not having the courage or the maturity to recognize it. Can you speak to that a bit? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think 
Yeah, I think in this book, it's sort of operating, just like you said, like there's sort of two competing desires within each of the characters. There's sort of what, what they're socially conditioned to want and almost because of their social situations, it's not even like you want it. It's like you absolutely, you need this in order to move forward in your life, just like as a woman in the early 18th century. Um, and then there's also like what they actually want and what actually be fulfilling to them which I mean it feels very we're very fortunate to be living in a time where we can even think about those things I think and I was really aware and I wanted to be really aware while writing um of their particular like these two girls Louisa and Madalena of like their place in society and what they'd have access to like I really I didn't want to write a book that felt like it was like we dropped two modern day teenagers into um the 1700s like I really wanted to look at what maybe it might have felt like at the time and like ultimately it probably felt pretty bad like even the things that felt good you didn't have access to um and so I think it yeah I think a lot of it is maturity because when you're a teenager you know you are more impulsive and every small thing feels like the hugest thing in the world and every decision that you make you know feels irreversible and then when you make an irreversible decision often you've made the wrong one um so I was interested in sort of that as a teenager but also then sort of like what are the stakes for somebody living in this very unique society um and although Venice was unique to Europe at the time there also were a lot of commonalities in terms of like you know what was available to women and also what was available to people of different um like social classes and of different financial situations and so a lot of like I think if you were to take these characters and put them you know if they were making the same decisions today, to me at least, um, there are ways in which you'd be like, oh, you're clearly the bad guy if you're making this choice in 2023. But like, it feels much more like you're just sort of a product of your situation if you're making that choice um, in the early 1800s. And so how I'm interested in sort of like how desire then can weave in and be channeled and used sort of under those constraints yeah and speaking of choice um and choices made we we were talking the other day about uh your former novel the upstairs house and you said this really great thing about how you'd been thinking about this idea of splitting and choosing one path over another and being haunted by the choices that we make by the person that we may have been had our choices or circumstances been different. And I kept thinking about that as I was reading Madalena. Um, and was that idea on your mind as you were writing? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was, I was thinking a lot about, I was interested both in sort of like what people do when they feel like they're desperate, mm -hmm. but also what people do when they know that they don't, aren't going to face consequences, <laughs> um, you know, like I, cause I think that the divide between like the nobility, the very rich and like the orf, the poor orphan foundling uh, in this book is like super stark. And there are moments where the power, I was interested in, in playing with that power balance so that it like appeared to shift, but does it ever really shift when somebody mm. has a ton of money and family name and, you know, protection and somebody else has just themselves, um, and so I was interested in, in that as well of like, what choices do we make? And I think it's really hard to live particularly like in America at the now and at the time when I was writing this, which was like, you know, 2019, 20, 21, whatever, like it, it's, we see all around us sort of how some people suffer consequences, like people can do the same exact thing, but depending on like your positioning in the power system, like you're going to have very different consequences. And so that was something I was really interested in as well. And I think it's something that to me feels like it resonates with sort of our modern society in a way that maybe some of the other ideas of, you know, like what queerness was back then or music or marriage or things like that, like that's very different. But I do think sort of like the fact that different people have different consequences and know that when they're making the choices, like that remains. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Another really interesting sort of motif uh, in the book is this idea of the mask um, and how the nobility uh, of Venice 
several months of the year would wear these masks. No one knew, you know, who mm-hmm. they really were. And then there's an important scene where Madalena actually uh, sacrifices a mask that was her mother's as an offering to this creature in the canal in order to, to get what she wants. Um, and also the musicians um, in the Pieta are, are performing sort of behind this. Yeah. Plate. So um, there's like a lot of concealment going on. Um, what does this idea of like the mask and, and the concealment sort of mean to you? Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, it, it all, it came from um, sort of the actual history of carnival in Venice, which back then was not just like a crazy week before Lent. It was like a month long thing um, where I, I was it, like, it was, really? For yeah, months. <laughs> yeah, it was. Um, and I've also people have I've like had people be like, this is wrong. There wouldn't be carnival in November. It's like, no, you don't understand. There was carnival all year long. Like it paused in the summer, so like go on vacation, and then they came back and had carnival. <laughs> like, um, but yeah, so that it it feels like you can't really write about it's hard to write about Venice without masks. And then the idea of masks and selfhood in like romantic relationships is really interesting, um, mm-hmm. as well, of or or even in friendships, just like a mask as like both disguise and sort of protection against vulnerability and um, you know what that means when you think you know somebody but they've put up a mask or they've taken off a mask or you know you're putting on a role and you're playing a character so I was interested in the masks in all of those ways um, and then also the the screen um, for the girls playing at the Pieta like that was again like a factual that's how they were allowed to play but they were only allowed to play if like nobody could really see them um although they sort of got around this like you know in church they could only play if no one could see them um and so the idea too of like performance was really interesting to me because Mm -hmm. nowadays when you think about a performer like so much of it is visual like there's a whole term for it the maniera is the italian of like what you're like and look like and sort of like the way that you're presenting while performing. And it's like, you if you take that away, you're taking away so much. And what you're putting in place is these, almost in the same way, like it's not a sexualization necessarily of these like young girls or these women, but it is sort of just like a, you're projecting your own, whatever you want them to be. And it's interesting because um, there were stories about people who would come from other parts of Europe, like Venice was already part of sort of the grand tour at this point and people would come and they'd write and they'd write about like, oh my gosh, these angels playing behind like the most beautiful girls you've ever seen playing music. And they couldn't see them because when you actually, the people who actually got into see them are like, oh, this one's missing an eye and this one limps and this one has small, like they were like orphans in, you know, the early 1700s. So like they weren't, (laughs) you know, but you could project like when you can't see somebody, when you have a mask, like whether or not it's a mask by choice or someone else has put it on you, you know, you, people see what they want to see or what you want them to see. So I was really interested in that and sort of the way those things would interact. The story is told through two points of view, um, Madalena and Luisa, and, and we jump back and forth between these two. And you've said that you wanted the structure to feel like a piece of music. Yeah. Um, did you know that you wanted that from the beginning or is that something that kind of came about like through the writing process? Yeah, I knew that I wanted, I knew I wanted it to be two characters who sort of were having the same experience, but interpreting it vastly differently or viewing it or sort of, you know, taking different things from it. Um, and I've always been interested in books that sort of like play with structure and form. Um, And so like Alexander Chi's The Queen of the Night is a novel that was a huge inspiration for this book. It's a novel, but it takes all of these elements of opera and uses that sort of in the structure. And um, so I had read that and trying to think if there's anything else like at the time that was like sort of so like ekphrastic almost. but yeah, I was like, well, what if I did the same thing? What if I tried to do what that book is doing, but instead made it about like Baroque classical music? Um, and I sort of figured out like something that is 
unique to like uh, an orchestral piece is the way like the melody will trade like the instruments will sort of pass the melody back and forth mm -hmm. um and so you'll hear the same thing but either it'll be played by a different instrument or it'll be very similar but it'll have like a slight variation and so what I wanted was for the narration to sort of echo that experience um which is you know when I my first draft of it was a lot more of that going back and forth but there's like you know listening to a 10 second thing being repeated differently is very different than reading a 20 page chapter sort of with slight variations mm -hmm. um, to sort of adjust for the form um but I was definitely always interested in like I'm always interested in like the musicality of language and writing about music seemed like a very apt way to sort of explore that did uh which point of view did you start with did I start? I think it's, I think Louisa actually I started with. Um, the prologue was the first thing I wrote. Mm -hmm. Then I wrote sort of Madalena from Louisa's point of view. Yeah, no, it was actually Louisa for a while, and I didn't write that sort of early Madalena opening chapter until fairly late in the not that late, but like much like further on. I had already sort of established Louisa, which is funny because I think Madalena was a much easier character to write in certain ways just because she's very strong-willed and opinionated and that's always like you know you can be like okay I know what this person would do as opposed to someone who sort of pauses and takes their time and is a little more mild um but uh, yeah I started with Louisa and I started with like Madalena coming into the Pieta and like what that would do did you write mostly Louisa like the whole way through and then go back and start like what? bringing in Madalena no, or at a certain kind of point I like I I shifted. I probably wrote like the first like 40 pages maybe and then did another, you know, however many pages of Madalena and then started just going back and forth as like the ball was rolling of, you know, here's what this one sees, here's what this one thinks and vice versa. Um, but I did like in my first draft, I had a lot of, I think I would, I would, maybe not the majority, but like a good, maybe half the scenes were sort of, I had them both both perspectives for the scenes and then I had to go through and cut and find like which is the stronger one and what can just be a sentence that sort of says what I'm trying to say in the repetition of this entire thing so that's a lot of work <laughs> um as we've we've talked about you mentioned earlier there were a lot of complicated politics and societal rules and and customs um in this world of 18th century Venice and uh you've managed to weave in you know, this seamlessly to this very sort of atmospheric story. Did you struggle with how to do that? How to get all of that exposition in yeah. there? <laughs> <laughs> that's, I mean, I think that's always, almost always the hardest part, especially if you're writing about something that's not sort of in the popular lexicon at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, like all of the research, I think it's really tempting as a writer, no matter what you're doing, to want to just like throw in all of the interesting research that you've done. But often that doesn't serve the story that you're trying to tell and the book that you're writing. And so then it becomes a balance of like, how do you get the reader the information that they absolutely must know? How do you determine sort of what is interesting to you, but doesn't necessarily serve the book? And then how do you like, just sort of balance plot and momentum with, um, all the exposition and for this one it was especially difficult because it's like not just oh here's this little thing I have to explain it's like no this entire world is totally different um but I did I took a lot from I think like world building when we talk about world building um we often refer to like fantasy or science fiction or sort of these fantastical things but like historical fiction needs to be built just as carefully mm -hmm. and so using some of those techniques and looking at some of those the tools people use when building out like a fantasy world, I think can be really helpful. Even if what you're building out is something that's like based in fact of just knowing like when to give information and which information to give. You are inspired by fairy tales. Um, we've talked a little bit about um, The Little Mermaid being sort of an inspiration uh, behind this book. Are there other fairy tales that you pulled from for for this particular story? I mean, I was I was very interested in The Little Mermaid and also in sort of like twisting The Little Mermaid to like make mm -hmm. 
essential character feel like a real person and not just sort of like a Disney princess, um, mm-hmm. which arguably in like the original Hans Christian Andersen, she still sort of feels like a cipher, um, which again, it's a fairy tale, so it makes sense. But I was interested in like what an actual person might do put in some of these positions. Um, yeah, so that was a big influence here. I don't know if there were any other fairy tales. I mean, like the Faustian bargain is mm. definitely a big thing. Um, but again, you could sort of argue that the Little Mermaid already is sort of a common, like a riff on the Faustian bargain. Um, so yeah, for this one, it was mostly just that. And then how that could sort of um, coincide and like weave in with like the actual history. Because the Disney version is a bit lots of people know of the little mermaid is very yeah. is different very like, different than yes. like the Hans Christian mm-hmm. Anderson version yeah it uh the the original version takes a very dark turn and <laughs> in Disney they just happily get married so <laughs> <laughs> um you have a book with two young teenage girls um as protagonists In a publishing world where people are always thinking about where does this go on the shelf? Which book does this sit next to? What section does it go in? Um, Did you have any thoughts or feelings about this potentially being classified as YA? I mean, for this, so for this particular book, I think I had already firmly established myself as an adult writer in a way that made it easier probably for them to position me like I think following a book that I just written about like postpartum depression I think they can very easily be like oh let's put it in this lane um but with my first book which also has a teenage protagonist that was something that we sort of encountered um although I actually did I just did a panel with someone who was talking about how do you know something is YA and she's like it's like you know it's like that quote about pornography like you just know it when you see it but she's like (laughs) Madalena as an example, or is like this just so clearly isn't YA. And I think part of it is because um part of it is like the interest in language, perhaps at the expense of having having um I think that an adult audience has more patience for sort of the interest in language and rhythm and things like that that I have. Um, but I also just think it's yeah, I think the language is a big part of it. Um, but I, it's very frustrating to me because YA seems like it's clearly, you know, like the it's young adult because it's for a young adult audience and it's written like for a young adult audience. And I guess my books aren't, but there is, I don't know, there's something people just don't take teenage girls seriously. I mean, I'm ready to rant about this because the new Olivia yeah. Rodrigo album just came out and <laughs> I love her so much. I think she's brilliant um and her first album actually was a really had a really big impact on writing Madeleine in the dark like tapping into some of those teenage feelings but just to see the response people have where they will just write off anything that young women do or make or are trying to say as like the most bad faith interpretation possible when it's like no you can be a smart 20 year old like yeah. um <laughs> So I think that the YA, like that conversation is part of it because like, I don't know, there's lots of books about like young men that people don't ask that about. So I don't know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I like the rants. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so mad. I'm so mad on her behalf because I think she's so brilliant and people are so mean She's about great. <laughs> um, let's talk about voice. In this novel and in all of your work, there's like this strong, clear, rich voice that um, that really comes through. And so I'm wondering about your process with that and and how, how does this voice come to you? Um, is it quite strong from the first draft or is that something that you kind of chip away at and bring out through revision? Yeah, I, unfortunately, I need it to be there from the start. And I think some of the problems that I've encountered with books that I have like ideas that I've been very interested in, but have not quite been able to get the voice. Um, like, I think that there are times when, you know, like there might, have, if I, if I was able to just write it and then add the voice in after I might've written a book, but um, yeah, no, it, 
I won't start writing until it's there. But then usually once it is there, it all, it's almost like you've tapped into a vein. Um, and that's sort of what the voice is letting me access. Um, and if I haven't done that and having just, I mean, I'm fairly recently set aside a project that like I made a pretty big dent in, but just doesn't have that, you know, mm -hmm. uh, for, in, in favor of just starting something new, because I do think like that is such an essential part of my own personal process. Like, I don't think I'm somebody who, you know, like my, my main talent does not lie in sort of like writing a crazy plot twist or, you know, putting together something totally cinematic. Like, I think that the voice is so central to what I'm doing that if I don't have it there with me right away, like a lot of stuff falls flat, mm -hmm. which I think is probably annoying because people want to hear like, oh no, you just, you know, but it, it's not the muse. It's just, you just work, <laughs> but it's sort of, the, the work comes beforehand. Like, I think there's just a lot of like stewing to build mm -hmm. it up by the time I start writing that's there. What, um, do you consider yourself a plotter or a pantser? I mean, I'm guessing based on your, your last answer, what your answer will be for this one, but, um, yeah, I think <laughs> <laughs> if I had to choose one, I'm definitely a pantser, but I like, so it's, um, I think it's like E.L. Doctorow has a metaphor or a quote where he talks about how, when you're writing a book or when you're writing, you only need to see it's like you're driving across country and you only need to see like as far as your headlights mm -hmm. like you don't know where you're going but you can see as far as the headlights so I sort of believe in that process with the caveat that like there is a destination so I know sort of what I want the end or sort of the climax to be um and then I have sort of my like headlights guiding me like a little bit of the way ahead as I'm writing so I think it's I think it's a little bit of both because I know there are people who can sit down um, and just just go and see where it takes them. And I like to have an idea of like where I'm going to end up. I just don't yet know quite how I'm going to get there. Do you have that idea of where you're going to end up and maybe like climax? I mean, do you have that sort of from the beginning or <laughs> do you kind of? Pretty early on. Okay. I think with my first book, I didn't have that. And I ended up writing like several different books. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think it, I even, I think I even knew, I think I knew the ending, but I didn't know what I wanted sort of the shape of it to be. Like, I definitely believe in having a shape before you start or like a graph almost of like what, where like central ideas are going to cross or points of view or power shifts or whatever else it is so that you can almost, it's like you have like the tent poles and then you can build the whole thing over it, mm -hmm. um, which is very different from an outline, which to me is really stifling to be able to, to say, you know, this is exactly what happens in this scene. And then it's like, well, then why bother writing it? Like the fun of it is lost for me. Um, but I do think in my own experience, it is much more like, it's just a better use of time to get what you're doing. And since time um, is at this period of my life with like two small kids and other work to do, like I don't have, if I had the luxury to just sort of like play all day, maybe I would feel differently, but I do think there's something to knowing, you know, like this is the time you have to build it. This is how you want to fill that time productively is actually really helpful. What, um, what's your revision process like? It's different with every project. Um, but I think I'm, I'm definitely for the most part, um, very liberal with cutting things or with changing direction, mm -hmm. like early in a draft, because I feel like I have learned at this point that I can tinker with something forever and it probably will not be as good as whatever I would do if I just tossed it and redid it um, mm -hmm. or took it in a different direction and so I sort of like I let myself like there are things that I feel emotionally attached to and it's not like I'm you know erasing them from the world forever but I will take things out of a draft or shift gears or like move what I think isn't working um, pretty ruthlessly in a way that I think benefits me in terms of like getting a book 
done because it's like, I'm going to end up doing this anyway. Like I, my gut is telling me to do it. I'm going to end up doing this anyway. I might as well do it now. Um, and that has been a really valuable tool in my revision process because it means I'm not tinkering quite as much. Um, and yeah, I have um, my agent who I've been with since the beginning um, is just a really wonderful first reader. And so what I have historically done is given her, once I have like a good chunk, a good start, um, I have, if I get stuck, I'll give it to her and see what she thinks. Or if I have a voice and I'm like, is this a good voice? Like, what do you think? And so she'll be sort of an early reader before it's done um, in a really helpful way. And then I have a writing group who ultimately I will share drafts with. Um, but yeah, yeah, I guess that's part of, part of revision because usually it's once yeah. the book is done. Um, but I do think, I think like the biggest thing that I have learned is like just being able to not hold anything as like so precious that you can't get rid of it. Did you always know that you wanted to be a writer? Yes and no. Um, I have always been writing like since I was very young. I think like we had, you know, early desktop computer with like early Microsoft Word that I would go in and, you know, write the beginnings of like 25 different things to when I was a kid. <laughs> um, and then in high school, I took writing fairly seriously and like entered some competitions and took classes. But then in college, I sort of steered, I steered away from it thinking like one, I think that it wasn't necessarily a viable career choice and two that I did not have the self-control to say no to all of the different social events and things that happen <laughs> when you're like living within a few feet of all your friends yeah um, I really didn't write in college at all um, I took one creative writing class like on the very back end because I was able to finally fit it in with um, all my required courses but then when I got out of school and I suddenly wasn't living with <laughs> I was like, oh, I really enjoy this. I like it. Um, and I sort of returned to it like post-college and felt like I might as well take a stab at doing this like as a serious thing. And what was the road to publication like for you? I, so I got an MFA um, and worked on my first book was my MFA thesis. And so I had what I had done, which I think I would not advise anyone else to do, but like worked for me is I had quit my job in public relations and I was nannying full time. And so I was making money. I was making like more money than I was making in PR, um, but I wasn't using, it's like the part of my brain that I needed. Like, it's just such a different part, which is, it's funny now because now that I have kids, it's a very different, like caring for somebody else's kids and doing like, I think I did a very good job of it. Like they were very happy. I don't think I was like neglecting the children. <laughs> but you still have much more room in your brain for other stuff than when it's your own kids. Um, and, but yeah, it was a very good, it was a good combination of work because the people who I knew who had office jobs or jobs that required them to be at a computer, I think had a much tougher time at the end of the work day going in and, you know, shifting gears. Mm -hmm in the same format. Um, so that was good. So I wrote the book and, um, it was my thesis and I revised it after submitting and graduating. I like revised for a few months. Um, and then I just sort of cold queried, uh, I had gotten like one or two, um, introductions from my MFA program, but it wasn't, it was just sort of like professors being like, here, you can, you know, query my agent. Um, but it wasn't necessarily they weren't the right fit for me. Um, like in retrospect, like it's pretty clear. Uh, so I sort of went back to the drawing board and I sent out like 40 different, you know, query letter, the same query letter. <laughs> and um, yeah, I got like a decent amount of flat out rejections, a lot of like here, send me it. And then you will won't hear from me again months later um or like you know oh this is so close it's just not quite the right fit for me I'm not the right agent for this all this stuff and then I finally my it was like I had gotten a rejection from someone who I felt would be a really good fit and had like read the whole thing um and I was like I'll just send out a few more queries just who knows and one of them was my agent um who immediately responded and was like who are your influences like 
let's do this, blah, blah, blah. And like, by, she wanted a phone call by the end of the weekend. Like it was like a very serendipitous moment and she was just getting started. Um, my agent is Stephanie Delman and she's uh, at Trellis Lit. And at the time she was the assistant to the president of her old agency and was just getting like sort of had just started out on her own. So didn't have very many book sales, but like was very motivated, very hungry, had like a lot of people she could ask for advice. And um, when I talked to her, we just really clicked because the thing, the thing that people say, like, and I think it is really true is like, once you have an offer, you go back to those other people who've been sitting on it and are like, I have an offer. And then suddenly they're like, oh, no, I'm interested because we all want what other people want. Mm -hmm. um, but Stephanie was like, from the very beginning, just seemed like the right fit for me. Um, and it has been, I mean, it's like, the best career decision I could possibly have made. Like she's since gone on to like start her own agency and has all of these like bestsellers and is just like a dear friend and like very, very good at her job and a great reader. Um, and yeah, so then I, once she was representing me, it went fairly quickly. Like I think we revised a little bit together and then sent it out um, and sold it at auction. And then I had to edit it a lot because it wasn't, as good. <laughs> it wasn't, I mean, I think, I think we both would say like uh, my agent and I both would be like, we probably sent it out a little early. We're kind of green. Um, but yeah. And then I had the same editor for the first two books um, and she left the house and I have a, uh, also left the house, but like went in a different direction for the third. Um. Most of your work has, you know, a supernatural element to it. What draws you to um, the speculative mm. side of fiction? I like being able to talk about, I think that there are certain things that are very difficult to talk about straight on, um, whether it is like sort of desire or postpartum depression or just like resentment or just like all of these different things where you if you talk about it sort of almost at an angle people understand what you're saying and you can address it and approach it in different ways and I think that using speculative elements sort of helps there um in that you can like say the thing you're really trying to say when you let go of realism um or at least I found that it's funny because I'm working on something right now that doesn't have a speculative element to it um and we'll see sort of if one weaves its way in there but it sort of feels like oh no but I can like say what I'm trying to say without it um and so yeah yeah we'll see what happens but I also think it I, I think it's a lot of fun to write with something a little bit supernatural or speculative and so that is part of it too. Like if I get bored where I'm at with this project, I'll probably be like, oh, got to introduce a ghost. <laughs> <laughs> well, and and similar for um, historical fiction, what draws you to that sort of, that historical side of things? I mean, I really enjoy the research. I enjoy having like a world that, uh, like a real actual world that you can come in and play with. Um, and I think I also am just like, very interested in history in a way that like the older I get the more I understand like oh yeah this is like real people lived in a real time in a way that I feel like when I was in school learning history it felt much more um sort of separate from my own experience as a human being and so I love just being able to be like oh like these are just like these were people like it wasn't just sort of talking heads on your TV screen or, you know, philosophers writing incomprehensible things. Like these were human beings who felt and experienced and responded. Um, and so I think it is just very, like, I just sort of get a lot of joy from trying to envision what real life would be like for people um, in a way that I think straight history, like without the fiction doesn't give you um, and straight fiction I don't feel like I have as much to say about contemporary life that other people aren't already saying in different avenues, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, although Upstairs House has like, you know, there, there is some, but mm -hmm. I do like the history just is, I don't know, it feels like something, you can say something new about something old with historical fiction. Cool. 
Do you have a writing routine? I'm sure it's probably different now um, with two it's been, <laughs> yeah, it's been different you started for, out. It's been different for every book. Um, <laughs> I, for my first one, I had what felt like no time, but now seems like so much time because I didn't have kids yet. Um, and then for the second one, I had one kid and wrote during his naps. Um, and then with the third one, I wrote, and this sounds insane, after the kids went to bed at night, which like I could never do now. I don't know. I don't know what I was. I was like on some, I don't know, some sort of like COVID induced isolation high. I don't know. Um, but yeah, so I, and right now I'm trying to do, this is something one of my students does and I'm trying to do it is like set a timer for 20 minutes, write, give myself a little break, set a timer, write. Um, but it is tough because I have like two hours of childcare a day. So who knows? Um, but I will say I did my first residency at this point. It was um, like eight or nine months ago. And it was for a project that I've since set aside. But the residency model, like, yes, if you can, if you can swing it, that is great. You can just get up, work on your book all day. Know you have this like condensed amount of time to do it. Not have to worry about making dinner or paying bills. <laughs> that's, Are you that's able? I'm ideal. interested in this <laughs> because I like, I have this you know, beautiful, like picture in my mind of, yeah, being able to like going to a residency somewhere and being able to like get up in the morning and just write all day. But I wonder, can you really do that? Can you like sit down or is it, it has to be sort of desperate for the time? Like I think yeah. if I have that, I, I think if I had the option to do that at any time in my day-to-day -day life, even if it was just the weekends, a residency would not be so effective. Mm -hmm. um, but I have like two small children and there's just no world in which I can do that and like have the time I need and so when I did it it was like I would you know like write for a little while and then go for a walk and then come back and write and then you know like ideally I would like you know go I would write I'll go for a run I would come back and write I would do yoga like I don't know like some sort of something else um and I think for short periods of time for me, at least, it's totally sustainable. But I also was at the residency with people who I think were like, by noon, I have to go do something else. So I think it just depends on who you are and like where you are in the project. Do you have a favorite writing exercise or something to get you going? Hmm. Yeah. yeah. Let me think. I really like, so something that I have found is really useful um, is to try to do the, like identify what your sort of crutch is in terms of description, like what sense you lean on the most and then try to write a scene without that. So like if you're a writer who really relies on a lot of visual description to challenge yourself to just like write without visual description or if, you know, I don't know, usually it's almost always visual for most people who, you know, um, and sort of, I think that is really useful for trying to build out a scene and like put myself in a space. Um, and then I also am a fan of the like interviewing your characters sort of of, and often, you know, I'm just like, why are you like this? And then I'm like, okay, here, what would they say? <laughs> so, and that usually opens some doors as well, especially if it's a character who um, like is not a point of view character or somebody sort of like on the periphery who I'm trying to understand. Oh, I love that. Are there other questions that you always why are you like this I, I, I mean it so it sort of comes from like the Proust questionnaire which one of my friends uh is a really big proponent of where she does it like my friend Katie Gutierrez um does it for like before she starts writing a book she like asks these questions for all the characters but I can't I need to like have them exist before I can oh. ask but the Proust thing is like you know what is what is your greatest fear like what is your deepest love or what does your ideal day look like it's like things like that um but for me I'm much more like what makes you tick or like what in particular is making you do this one particular weird thing um that is impacting the book <laughs> so mm -hmm. I'm, it's a much more I think like um selective approach to it but that definitely is a way like I've had students and again like I've got friends who swear by you know going through the whole thing and asking questions and I think it's come sort of back in vogue from whenever Proust first introduced <laughs> it <laughs> what do you know now that you wish you had known um before publishing your first novel oh my gosh um I think 
I think I have realized that the best part of it for me is the actual writing. Like, obviously there are times where it's really hard and there are moments where it feels like the hardest work I'll ever do. Um, but nothing feels quite as good as sort of like tapping into that moment of flow and that perfect thought and sort of like coming up with that sentence and or knowing, you know, what the next scene is going to be. Like those moments right there feel just as good, if not better than the highs of publishing, at least the ones I've experienced, you know, like I have it, you know, maybe if Reese Witherspoon chose my book for her book club, I'd be like, oh, no, <laughs> the best thing. But, um, but in, I think in your like average, the, the average person's experience of publishing, like there are really wonderful things that can happen. And then there are really hard things that can happen. Um, but the actual creation of the book, when it's like just you and your ideas, is just something really special that I didn't, I feel like I was rushing so hard to like you know make a career and get a name for myself and like I mean obviously if you're somebody especially if you're someone who can write like a book a year and that's your paycheck like it's it's different um but I think really like holding those moments as like oh yeah this is just as much like the sentence I wrote is just as much an accomplishment as selling the book sort of on a how does it feel in my body level like obviously there are, there are other s sorts of rewards um but in terms of just like my own personal happiness I think um, and I have tried to remind like my students, especially that like, you know, there is no, there's for most of us, there's no rush and it, it is, it becomes something very different once you've sort of given it to the world and it's nice to have it for yourself for a little bit. I love that. Okay. Last question is the last usual question. And based on our, uh, conversation earlier, I think I have an idea of where this might go, but um, when, I won't say if, when Madalena and the Dark gets turned into a movie or series, <laughs> what do you think should be the theme song? Oh, yeah. I mean, obviously, <laughs> Olivia Rodrigo. I will, um, I love Brutal, which was like her first song off her first album, I think is just so perfect for the description of like, how difficult it is to be a teenage girl I would love that so much I also love a good sort of like anachronistic music choice like um Sofia Coppola's Marie Antoinette where it's playing all the like 2000s mm. punk over the you know, <laughs> over the Versailles and things like that um I don't know I I like that and to me it's funny because to me the book has always felt very much like oh yeah this feels you know like like that like the hot pink letters on the you know Venetian whatever it is um although I think that other people like reading it don't always catch that thread um but I feel like any sort of film adaptation I would love to have it be like sort of the the um the real contemporary emotions even in these like historical social situations and I feel like Olivia's got that <laughs> perfect <laughs> Julia, thank you so much. Thank you. This has been so much fun. Thanks for joining us on Literary Prospects. If you liked what you heard, please subscribe and leave us a review. We'll see you next time.